Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome back from Happy. We're, we're back from, uh, let's see, Georgia, the hospital, and several other places in between the last time. we Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Y'all look lovely today, by the way. Yeah, clean up nice. I feel like I'm really loud. Am I loud? I feel like I'm loud. So, Okay, well, this morning, I'm going to just jump right into it. How about that? And I was excited to hear about BBS. I heard you guys had a great BBS. I heard it was hotter than the blazes out there. But uh, thank you for your faithfulness and sharing the gospel message. Uh, every time we get to deliver or preach the message, it is the gospel message. The message ultimately is about Jesus Christ and him in our lives and him doing the saving, him doing the changing, and him being glorified. Can we all agree that that's where we're going here this morning. And that the Word of God is our, what we believe, right? It, ch- makes, it makes changes in our behavior. And it's our authority for our lives. Do we agree on that? Can we agree on that? Then we can have success path for, uh, for you to listen to what God has in His Word. Not my words, but what He says here. And we all can walk away that we spend some valuable time in our life together, but also being exhorted, be challenged, and to become more like Christ in our in our daily walk so let's get into it the title of my sermon this morning is stick in there how many times you've heard people tell you over the years that you just need to stick in there stick in there what they're really saying is be patient how many of you here by a show of hands would say that you're a patient person three people that's wonderful this is just your message this morning. Congratulations. How many would say that you have times of impatience? Raise your hand. So I thought about this morning. I just thought, what are some of the things in our life that make us impatient? And you probably have the list as well as I do. Your mind's already moving. But I wrote mine down the list because if it happened more than three days ago, I can't remember. Right? So I got to write stuff down now these days. So Here's my list. Waiting in a doctor's office. You have a 10 o'clock in the morning uh, appointment, and you don't get taken until quarter till 11, 11 o'clock to see the doctor. I become impatient, frustrated. I feel like the doctor is not valuing my time. Is it just me? Thanks for joining me. I appreciate that. How about this one? Waiting in line for a restaurant. How many's ever gone to a restaurant, put your name on the list, they told you it was 30 minutes to wait, and while you're sitting there, you become more impatient, and you look at your spouse and say, we are out of here. I am done waiting. I've done that, right, Crystal? You all laughing, but you all did it too, right? How about this, the flight delays at the airport? I cannot tell you how many times I've flown and have had delays or they've changed the flight time and I missed my flight. An example was Denver, Colorado in 2000 and maybe 15. Let's call it that for sake of argument. And I had an eight hour delay in Denver because I just missed them closing the door of my plane by literally three minutes. Ask me if I was happy. Ask me if I was showing Jesus at that moment in my life. Just ask me. Don't ask me. <laughs> okay, here's my favorite one. So my favorite one is the DMV. How many's ever gone to the DMV? What do you do when you walk in the DMV? You walk in, you fill your paperwork out, and what do they have you do? Take, take a number. And how many of you know you sit there, you watch that clock, and you're waiting for your number to appear, and you're thinking there's only 20 more people. It should only be 10 more minutes, but it's an hour and a half. That drives me insane. It makes me impatient. How many has ever gone down 376 toward the Squirrel Hill Tunnel in Pennsylvania or Pittsburgh? I still can't figure out to this day when you get on the other side of the tunnel what the problem is. Because there is no accident, but there's a backup two miles long on the other side of the tunnel. And I read about this, and I find out that it's literally it's the tunnel effect. The people are going into the tunnel, they think they're being squeezed, so they slow down, thinking that somehow they're not going to get squeezed. I don't understand it, but that's what I, I get impatient in that traffic. We were just there this past week. We left at, what, 2 o'clock in the afternoon to go downtown Pittsburgh. 
and we get on 376, and what you know, it's backed up, and we were sitting for 25 minutes, and I said some words I probably should not swear words, just not very nice words about people in my way. And how about this one? This one may hurt a little bit, but how many of you are patiently, be honest, patiently waiting for a new pastor? Why is it crickets in here all of a sudden? How about this one? I have been waiting patiently for the Lord to give me the opportunity to finish up my sermon series on the book of James. I started in 2018. The last sermon I preached here was in chapter 4, I think, of James. And that was in 2000, so it's a year and a half. But God is gracious. And he's allowing me to show up again to deliver the rest of the book of James to you in his time. And again, I will say in his time because I wanted to finish it before I left, but Ben threw me out before then, so we'll blame Ben. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not Ben's fault. It was God's, God uh, had plans. It was a great plan for you to have a full-time pastor, and that was awesome. So today, we are going to jump into James chapter 5. I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to that passage, starting at verse 7. And I'm going to ask you to stand. Would you stand, please? And if you would just follow along while I read, that would be great. Okay? I may have you chime in once in a while just to make sure that you're awake. If somebody looks sleepy beside you, please reach over and then pinch them. You have my permission. All right? James chapter 5, starting at verse 7. Be patient. I can just say sit down, but I won't. Be patient then, brothers, until the, Lord come, the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, huh, he seems to be uh, calling me out in that passage. You too, be patient and what? Because the Lord's coming is what? The Lord's coming is near. Verse 9, church, don't grumble against each other. Who's he talking about? Turn to the person beside you, and he says he's talking about you. That's right. Thank you for doing that. Don't grumble against each other, brothers or sisters. I'll add that, okay? Or you will be judged the judge is standing at the door. Verse 10, brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Verse 11, as you know, we consider, we consider blessed those we have persecuted. Oh, sorry, persevere, not persecuted. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Let me say that again. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above, above all others, above all others, above all, my brothers, do not swear not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, or you will be condemned. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this word that is your inspired word is the authority that you have spoken in the word for us to hear this morning. May we take this and listen and, and not only be doers of the word, but as James has taught us, to also be doers of the word. So, Father, I pray that you would just lift this time up uh, uh, to your ears, speak to hearts, and change our lives for your glory. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So let's make some observations about this passage real quick. This passage 7 through 12 is linked to where? The first six verses. And the first six verses up above, the verses above are dealing with people who are persecuting others. People who are not treating others fairly. Uh, people who are being oppressed financially. People who are being murdered. Innocent people who are being devalued, if you will. 
And so when we get to this lower portion of passage, we need to tie that together. And what I want, what I want you to hear is James' voice, who was the author of this book. When he's writing this, I want you to hear the tender tone of compassion, how he dresses these Christians. This book was written to Christians, all right, to Christians, for Christians, which is for you, right, for you to learn, for you to hear, and for you to follow, and that includes all of us. Three times in verses 7, 9, and 10, I want you to circle the word in your Bible, the word brothers. Brothers. Brothers is a term of an endearment, right? You're my brother. I'm talking affectionately about you. I have concerns for you. I want the best for you in your life. And so there is a, there is a key word here that the brothers has an intentionality about, about a relationship. And then there's this word patient that pops up in this verse. A couple times in verses 7 and 8, three times. And in verse 10, it pops up. And so we have this relationship going between the brothers and sisters in the church or the relationships that are happening. And then we have this word patience used. But the overall theme, I want you to hear this clearly. The overall theme of this passage is patiently waiting upon the return of Jesus Christ. Some of you say, oh, no, here's my concern. When I talk about the second coming of Christ, how many of you have ever been on an airplane? I've said this before, I think maybe two years ago. And the, the uh, stewardess gets up and they start giving instructions about the safety, what to do, fasten your seatbelts, the mask falls down. What do you do? You tune out. You tune out. So when we start talking about patience in the second coming of Christ, my concern is the church tunes out because they can't, we can't see, well, how in the world is that applied to my life right now? Because you don't know the problems I'm having and the return of Christ is going to happen. I know it is, but I don't know when, but I've got all these issues I've got to resolve today. So give me something for today. Well, I'm glad you came to church today because here's the reality. The book of James is a very practical book. He's going to show you what we're to do. We're to be patient, but also he's going to tell you how we're to wait and what we're to do while we're being patient. Actually, you're going to get some real practical tools that God gives you in his word because I've heard Christians tell me before, I read the Bible and I get nothing out of it. It doesn't deal with my issues. Oh, you've got some issues, and I've got some issues. But the news is, is that the Bible gives you direction for your life each time you open it. Because the Holy Spirit, if you're a believer, is teaching you if you're open it, open to hearing it. So my prayer this morning is that you be open to hearing what he has for you. All right, let's get back to it. <clears throat> So in verse 7, we talk about the second coming of Christ. It says in verse 7, until, underline these words, until, until the Lord's coming. Verse 7, underline it. Verse 8, because the Lord's coming is near, indicating the second coming of Christ. Because the Lord's coming is near. Verse 9, the judge, who is the judge we're talking about here? We're talking about Christ. The judge is standing at the door relating to the second coming of Christ. This literally can be translated, the coming of Christ. He is at the edge, on the edge, right at the edge. It's just about to happen. Let me stop here. So what that means is, hello, it means that it should matter to us how we live each day. It should, it should shape our actions and our behaviors if we truly believe that Christ could return at any time. Instead of doing, yawn, yawn, pastor, please be done. You should say, pastor, tell me how we're to live in, the, in waiting for Christ because I've been doing a lousy job at it. Or maybe I've done a great job at it because the next event on God's, God's calendar is the coming of Christ. 
Romans 13, 12. Open your Bibles, Romans 13, 12. Leave it at James. Put your finger there. Sorry, if you have an electric uh, gadget, you can put your finger. I don't know what to do with your finger. You figure it, you figure it out, all right? It says this in Romans 13, 12, if you're there. The night is almost over, and the day is almost here. Listen, what Romans is talking about here is the return of Christ is almost here. The question is, do you believe it? Are you living in the light of that return? Are you, li- or are you spending too much time listening to your news channels and worry about what's going on in the world versus what's going on, what Christ wants you to do in your life? Because I watched some news this week, and I got to tell you, I get depressed after watching about hours of news. And I don't care which side of the aisle you're on, it's still depressing because there's always fighting and bickering. And I am 57 years old, and I got to tell you, I'm ready for some peace in my life. How many ready for some peace in your life? The Bible gives us peace. Christ gives us peace. If you're not saved, you're living without peace. And the hope of Christ is or can and will give you that peace if you're here hearing that message this morning. But those who are most persecuted, those who struggle the most, I am convinced they are the ones that are looking forward most to the return of Christ. They say, come, Lord, come quickly. Take me home to my Father. I'm tired of this life. I'm tired. I'm weary. There's so much garbage that's going on. I just want to exit. So they, they're waiting for the return of Christ. So the main point today is simply this. What is being communicated is simply this. In verse 7, write this down if you're taking notes. The main point is this. We are called... We are called, did you get that? We are called to be patient while we wait for his return. Now, somebody's going to say, well, Arlie, that's not earth-shattering. Really? How are we living? Because it's not what you know. It's how you live, right? How do I apply it? Look at verse 7 again. Be patient then, brothers, until what? The Lord's coming. Be patient until the Lord's coming. The word patience. The word patience comes from two words meaning long-tempered. Long-tempered. How many believe today that you are a person of long temper? Don't raise your hand. The Oxford Dictionary, I looked this up, by the way, in the Oxford Dictionary. It literally means to be patient. The capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. So, how many of you are tolerant? How many of you are uh, delays suffering? You like suffering? You're patient in troubles? Or do you get angry and short-fused when you're angry because of your impatience? See, in verse 7 here, it speaks that Christ can return any time, and we're to live in the light of patience, patiently waiting for Christ to come. So we must live each day with the realization that Christ may return. And the problem is, I think, in a lot of churches, there's a whole lot of things that are preached, but we've forgotten about the return of Christ and how we're to live in the light of of the return of Christ. So today's your lucky day because we get to look at this return of Christ and how it impacts us. So because he's coming soon, I must be patient with whom? I must be patient with people. Look at the person beside you. Just look at them. Look at, now look at the other side and think, am I patient with that person? <laughs> Don't say a word. Don't, uh, no judging. It's self-reflection time. See, when I was in the Navigators years ago, when I was a young man, they would give us assignments like this, and we would have to go out into the woods, and we'd open our Bibles, and we'd have to journal of these type of questions. Who am I not impatient with? 
and who do I have to make amends with? And they would send us out for three hours in the woods, and we'd have to sit in silence, and it killed me to sit in silence. But I will tell you, it was one of the most richest times of my spiritual walk. Since God showed me that I am the worst of sinners when it comes to impatience. And I had a whole list of people. And I suspect that you might have a whole list of people. I'm assuming you're better than I am. It's okay. But I'm assuming you have your list. Now, in verse 8, James personalizes this call to be patient. He says, you too be patient. I wish he hadn't said that. Because before then, I thought he was talking to you. But see, when he says you too, he calls me out. Because the Bible is written for me, right? It's written for you. So I can't escape and say, Mary, that's on you. It's not for me or Ben or whoever you want. Just look around and select somebody else besides you. You can't do that this morning. Patience can be described as self-restraint. All right? It does not hastily retaliate a wrong. When we're patient with somebody... We are not looking to get back or even with somebody. We're not looking to right a wrong. We are letting God do his work, and we take the gavel out of our hand and let him do the work in that life. And Christians, hello, we are the worst offenders about judging others with the gavel. You shouldn't do that. When I myself should be doing a whole lot of things, but I'd rather judge your sin than mine because it's a whole lot easier to talk about you than it is me. Can we agree to that? Because you're a hot mess. But the truth is, so am I. I may even be a hotter mess, but I just happen to cover it up well with titles, right? And that's a fact. We all have need of the gospel message of salvation and forgiveness. We need to be people of repentance, which I communicated on August 19th. That was my first sermon back, I think. So much for my memory. I think that was it. So here's the question. Are you patient with the people that God has put in your life? Are you patient? Here's what I love about that test. There's only two, two answers. It's yes or no. Don't cheat on your neighbor's test. That's for you. Are you patient? I like what Psalm 37, 7 says. Psalm 37, 7, for those who are taking notes. It says this. Be still before the Lord. Now, some of y'all can't sit still in church, so you're already in trouble. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret When people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked scheme. How about this? Lord, why are they getting away with everything? And and I'm always seeing my life is being persecuted. I'm always having miserable times. The Bible says be patient. He's working out his will. He still loves you. He has forgot about you. He wants to encourage you. But you have to get into his word to receive the encouragement. And that's why you're here today, to be encouraged, to be exhorted, to live this life of, of our, the Christian life. Okay, in verse 8, here's the first point in verse 8. Stand firm, stand firm. Write this down, all right? This is the how, what, what, what are the things, what are the things that we can do to be patient, to show our patience, to wait on Christ's return? What are the things? Number one, verse 8. Stand firm in the midst of people you don't people that are doing you wrong. Stand firm in the midst of people doing you wrong. You got that? That's a long sentence for one point, isn't it? You got that? Verse 8. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is what? But Pastor Early, I'm going to give him a punch in the face if they don't knock it off. The Bible says stand firm. You say, well, i got to give him peace of my mind. And I would say, don't do it. You need that peace. Don't give it away. But the Bible says stand firm. The Lord is near. Behave like he instructs you to behave, not how your flesh wants you to behave. Does that make sense? 
Let the Holy Spirit have a say-so of how your reactions are, not your tendency just to react because I'm a tie-in or I'm whatever ethnicity you may be. And that's just what we do in our family. No, you are a disciple of Christ. You've been made new. You are to stand firm. You are not to react. You are to speak as the Holy Spirit speaks to you and react how he guides you. But we got to shut our mouth first and hear him speak to us. Can I get an amen? That was a whole lot of stuff, wasn't it? The word stand firm is the idea of being stable and standing fast. And when you're being persecuted, when you're being uh, under the gun, when you're being impatient, it's hard to be stable. You look like a, a top spinning around the room, don't you? Right? You look like one of those gyroscopes that's kind of moving around. But the Bible says the word is stand firm. In church, it's okay to be quiet and just breathe. Take the breath of God in. And let the Holy Spirit speak. And believe me, I'm as guilty as everyone else is. i got to remind myself the 10-second rule. Before I speak, count to 10, because if I don't, you may hear something that may not be edifying or glorifying to God, but it will glorify my flesh. Because i got to tell you something. Or do I? And why do I? Because I'm impatient with you. That's why I have to. And I'm not keeping the reflection of Christ is doing a work in your life that I don't know about, but I think I'm the judge. i got to give you something you don't have. So let me tell you one thing. It'll never be just one thing, though, will it? Never will be. This stand firm is the same verb in Luke 9, 51. In the passage here, it says, Jesus set his face to go toward Jerusalem. Jesus was on a mission. He knew that he was to be crucified for our sin. He knew that he was going to be resurrected again for our sin. And he set his face in the midst of death itself. And he stood firm. It carried out the Father's plan. We, as we reflect on the second coming, we are to stand firm and we are called to be patient in the light of all the bad attitudes and bad actions of others. Even though I want to give you a piece of my mind, sometimes I just need to shut my mouth and let God do the work in you because He knows more than I do, but I forget to remember that and recall that because I think. You need to change. And you think, I need to change. And the thing is, we're both right. But you're not the change agent. And I'm not the change agent. The Holy Spirit is the change agent. So can I ask you this morning, can you be patient with me? Can you be patient with the person beside you? Can you be patient? Well, we'll stop right there. There's a whole list of people you just keep on going through, right? Standing firm describes a person who is so certain of the Lord's intimate return. He or she, now watch this, he or she is not wiped out, but what is, that is what is happening in their life presently. Let me say it again. Let me say this one more time. Stand firm describes a person who is so certain of the Lord's intimate return, all right, that they are not wiped out by what's happening in their present circumstances or condition. Each one of us has some stuff going in our lives. And each one of us handle things, things differently. But I, I can promise you this. If we actually become doers of God's words, as James says, and live in the light of his intimate return, I guarantee it will make a difference in how we react to others. Okay, do we believe that? Because as we rely on Christ, we recognize the gospel message that he forgives me and the gospel, at the gospel message everything is equal to for the cross. I am a sinner who is in need of a savior and all of a sudden my impatience is that I believe that Christ is patient with me and I need to be patient with you because guess what? You're a believer also and you also are the same for the cross I am and the gospel message demands that we both repent of our ignorance that I think I have it all together in my arrogancy. My encouragement that you would do the same in, in God's love, right? We would hear that. 
So the verse in verse 8, the phrase coming near or at hand in this verse shows you must carry on because the Lord will come soon. We are to stand firm. Now listen, Alliance Theology 101. You ready? I'm going to do this in three seconds because I don't have time to do eight sermon series or a message on the coming of Christ today. Somebody say amen. Here's the two words in Alliance Theology. He is coming soon. And he's coming suddenly. Did I do good? That's it. Those are two things you remember. And we could have lots of sermons, lots of teachings. But in the context of this passage, what James is talking about, you need to remember that he is coming soon, and he will come suddenly like the thief in the night. Can we get an amen? Do we agree on the theology of the second coming of Christ? Because if we do, it has implications on our daily behaviors. It does. I love how the King James renders this verse in verse 8. It literally says that he draweth nigh. Instead of coming near, he says he draweth nigh. That's a good King James version right there, right? I just like that poetic, the poeticness of that, all right? Then we jump down to verse 11. It says, we are blessed, we remain steadfast, which means literally that we are blessed we bear under our trials and we stand firm and we bear the weight of our trials so when we are wronged we don't react when we are taken advantage of we should not react even some of us do what i do at times to be honest but the instruction of god's word is is that we are to wait patiently and in that patiently waiting watch this we are to do what is right what is right? We go back to verse 7. We are patient with our brothers in Christ. When they do something that against us, we want to blast them, we hold back. And we say, oh, you don't know what the Lord has in store right now. You ought to be nervous. Because it's going to be good. It's good. So we're called to be patient. So how should we wait? I want to go fast on this, so take some notes. I'm going to go fast. We are to wait. I hate waiting. Let's just say, get that out there on the table. Recently, I made a trip to Georgia with my beautiful wife, Crystal. We were down there. On the way down, we drove down on a Thursday. It was a Sunday after I preached the last time I was here. That following Thursday, we left, which has nothing to do with the story whatsoever. It's a free this part of the story. So we're driving down, and I had suspected, because she asked me a question earlier in the week about Hey, you probably should take a jacket and some pants uh, when you go to Georgia. So I'm thinking in the back of my mind, because I'm an engineer, I deduce things, right? I think things, I think things through. And so I'm thinking I'm going skydiving, because I've told her for years I want to go skydiving. And uh, so we're in the car on Thursday. She's actually driving, and um, I'm texting on the phone. I'm calling my doctor. She doesn't know that I know that I think I know. All right, because I'm being impatient. I'm, I'm texting my doctor. I said, Doc, can I go skydiving? And I'm thinking, you know, you always want to check with your doctor before you do something crazy like that. And he responds back like any medical professional would. Arlie, I'm not concerned about your health at all. I'm concerned about the parachute opening up. That's all he said. That was his response. So I got the green light. We're good. So, so it was Thursday. So I'm actually kind of excited now. I'm anticipating. I'm waiting. So we get to Friday. We get down to their her cousin's house. We have this party at the house. So things are just hanging out, playing games. And I'm watching everyone's behavior. And um, Tom, her nephew, comes up to about 11 o'clock that night and says, Arlie, don't forget to pull the ripcord. I'm going skydiving. But I haven't told her I know yet. So, long story short, here's coming quickly. So I've been waiting now for a day. All right? So 11 o'clock that night, I'm ready to go to bed. And her other cousin says, um, we have to move one piece of furniture for uh, the other cousin. And we have to go 45 minutes away to, to get this, right? So this is 11 o'clock at night. I'm like, something's up. This is Jeff, and Jeff is the coolest 28-year-old guy ever. He's really cool, right? And uh, so I'm going with him, I'm thinking. So we get in bed that night, and Crystal says, Crystal says to me, so I'm kind of excited, anticipating, waiting for this all to occur. Crystal says to me, um, I just may go with you in the morning to help just hang out and, and move that pe one piece of furniture with you. 
And we'll go out to breakfast, too, because she knows I can't resist breakfast. I love breakfast. So we do that, right? Now we're going to sleep. I'm excited like a kid at Christmas. I can't sleep that night, right? And, and she's like, you all right? So I'm good. I'm good. But I couldn't sleep. So I get up. I'm anticipating. I'm waiting. And I get up. I'm dressed first. I said, are you coming? She will go see if Trina, which is Jeff's mom's out in the kitchen, right? And she's up here. If she's up, I'll go with you. And I'm thinking, you guys are all such liars right now, but that's fine. So long story short here again, I look out, Trina's in the kitchen. Christmas gets up, Trina's with us. All four of us are going to move one piece of furniture 45 minutes away. Make sense to you guys so far? I'm excited, anticipating, waiting to do our stuff. We're driving. I said, this is not the way to Josh's house. And Crystal tells me afterwards she's cracking up laughing. It actually was. I just forgot about it. So, so we get to the, we pull to the, uh, the place where we're going to do skydiving. I didn't act like I knew what was going on. Crystal hands me a, a card, and it's a really lovely card, very special, beautiful card, thanking me, appreciation, anniversary, all that stuff. And uh, I read it, then I opened my phone. I said, oh, by the way, the doctor said it was okay if I go um, skydiving. He told me this on Thursday, and she screamed at that point. So why I'm telling you that long, long story is I knew about it. I was excited. I was anticipating. I could not wait to go. We get inside. You have to watch this video. And I'm thinking we're going to wait for like 15 minutes before I get on a plane and jump out of this thing, right? It was two hours. And where we had to wait, me impatiently waiting, I listened to that same video about eight times saying, there are risks that come with skydiving. It includes death. I'm like, let's just get this over with. <laughs> so, so, so finally my team come. We, get, we went up to about 10,000 feet in the air. I'm excited. And, and so the, well, I'm doing a tandem jump. So I, the, the, hole's, the hole's only about this big. They, they get you ready. They stand you up. And the guy says, okay, we're going to count to three when we jump out. He's bent your knees. I bent my knees. There was no three. He pushed me out. That was it. <laughs> so anyways, the whole point of the story is is that there is something exciting something amazing when you are when you are waiting anticipating and you do it patiently and, and you actually get to see go do what you wanted to do i cannot wait to the coming of christ i'm excited i'm anticipating i am hoping that he returns soon and i believe that he's gonna return suddenly and guess what all that impatience I had for those two hours waiting in the video room, listening to that same message of death over and over again. When I got in that plane I, and I jumped out and I was in the air, it all went away. And I am here to tell you, I honestly believe that we as Christians in our impatience, when Christ returns, all of our worries, everything we've been impatient about all that's going to go away and our focus is going to be on christ alone and we're going to be enjoying that moment and that moment for eternity so church hear me say this we must be people of patience if we're going to follow god's word and god's way can we get an amen and yes it was ten thousand feet it was amazing it was amazing so God's Word gives us examples of how we're to wait. I want to give these quickly. Number one, in verse 7, be steadfast and patient like a farmer. You see that in verse, verse 7? Underline that. Be like the farmer. A farmer is patient. What does a farmer do? He, I worked on farms for seven years, fruit farms. I know about planting trees, and I can tell you, you don't plant an apple tree and get fruit three months later. It takes years to get that first fruit. And some of us Christians need to be reminded that we need to be patient with young Christians because sometimes it takes a while to see their fruit instead of judging them harshly. So be patient, be steadfast like the farmer. In Israel, farmers would plant their seeds Plant their seeds in the fall, wait for the early rains. Then they would wait for the late rains to come in the spring. And a farmer worked while he waited. Listen to this. A farmer worked 
while he waited. What are we doing right now? We're waiting for Christ's return. So the church works while they wait. You follow on that? Get that, okay? So the, the Israel farmers would, would work while they're waiting because there was nothing he could do until the harvest came. Understand that? We're to work, and we're to work in that harvest. So Psalm 27, 14 says this, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and, let, and take heart, take courage, wait for the Lord. How many this morning need to hear that message? Be strong, take heart, be encouraged, don't give up, stick in there. Galatians 6, 9 says this, let us not become weary in well-doing, while in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Don't raise your hand. But how many are so discouraged that you kind of gave up? Your body's in the pew of the church, but inside you kind of gave up because you become impatient with people or you become impatient with the Lord's return, or you just become impatient, period. The Bible says, do not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest, and we do not give up. So that's number one. Number two, be steadfast, and continue witnessing, be steadfast, and continue witnessing like the prophets. I love that. Because I've studied the prophets over the years in ministry. And they've been such an encouragement to me. Because there are times when I've been discouraged. And I see the stuff they went through. And I've gone through nothing like they've gone through. So if you're looking to be patient. You're looking to learn patience. I would encourage you to study some prophets, right? Matthew 5.12 says this. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Do you get that? You're not the only one that has had troubles and trials and tribulations. For thousands of years, God's people have been experiencing tribulation. And here's a news flash: It's not going to stop today. So church... In our cancel culture we live in, you need to stand firm and stand fast and hold to the core beliefs and be encouraged to be steadfast in your witnessing for Christ. Don't shy away. Don't be afraid to speak up. Be bold, right? Be respectful. Be gracious. But you must speak if God says speak. Here's the point. Sometimes we think, well, those are prophets. They were special people, Pastor Early. Let me give this to you. They were ordinary people that God used to do extraordinary things for his purpose and his glory. For his purpose, not his purpose, purpose, purpose. His purpose and his glory. I would submit to you, you are an ordinary person, so am I. But God can do extraordinary things through you if you submit to him and listen to him and follow his ways and his word. You're saying, I already know that. What I always tell you, I don't care what you know. What are you doing with what you know? And that includes me also, right? In times of trials and suffering, we can learn from the mistakes. We can take lessons learned of God's people in the past Look at their lives and say, here's where they did things wrong. But I can learn from this, from history of God's word. And I can understand how God is working and what God wants for this generation, for, for my family, for my walk. I can learn from the prophets that in the midst of all things, they continue to speak out for the true God of Israel. They did not back down. Hebrews 6.12 says this, urges us to be like the prophets. Here's what it says. Write this out, Hebrews 6.12. So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience 
inherit the promises. He's talking about the prophets. Hebrews 11 is known as the Faith Hall of Hall of Fame. In there, it lists all of the Old Testament, a lot of the Old Testament saints that were sinners like you or I, that they were faithful to God. They were people of faith. They committed and submitted to the Lord, and God used them in a powerful way. Listen, listen to Hebrews 11, 36 to 38. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in the desert and mountains and in dens and caves of earth. But in all of that stuff, they maintained their witness. They maintained that Jesus, that God, that God was the one true God. They never backed down. In that culture, there was many people teaching. There was many different types of God, but they maintained their witness before the people. Jeremiah was one of my favorite prophets when I studied this in Bible college. Jeremiah, not the bullfrog. I'm talking about Jeremiah the prophet. He was steadfast in his witness. He was known as the, here's the test, the weeping Weeping prophet. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet, right? He preached faithfully for years, over decades and decades. People did not respond negative. People responded negatively to him. They didn't accept his teaching or preaching. He was chased down. He was beaten. He was put into stocks. He was put in a cistern to die. Anybody have this issue so far? He spoke out against the false prophets of the day who told the people in that day what they wanted to hear, not what God wanted, wanted them to hear. And any pastor who does that, I would be terrified to stand behind the pulpit to be that pastor. We are called to preach what God says in his word, not what we think. Can we get an amen? But here's the point. He maintained his witness. In Jeremiah 20, verse 9, write this down. I love this verse. But if I say I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary of holding on to it, and I cannot endure. Listen, he was called by God to preach. He, was, he kind of just was quiet for a while, and all of a sudden he realized he could no longer remain silent, that he must preach what God has put on his heart. Christians, each one of us has a calling that God has called his disciples to go and tell. And we need to look at Jeremiah as our example that the culture cannot define our mission. The culture cannot demand that we are quiet. The culture, we must, we must speak to the culture, but we must do it with boldness and with holiness. So be steadfast. Wait like the farmer. Witness like the prophet. And then the third thing, and I'll wrap up with this point because it's late, is be steadfast in worshiping God. Be steadfast in your worship to God. And in this passage, Job is meant. You see Job in that passage? Look at the verse. Let me tell you where the verse is at. You guys, I'm still looking. Give me a second. There it is. Look at verse 11. As, as you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of who? Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about all right so here we go so we are called to be steadfast in our worship what are you doing right now don't tell me you're sleeping you're worshiping you're worshiping not just in church but at home in your car we are called to worship in the midst of struggles and persecution when everyone's abandoned Job when everything is taken from Job what does Job do he worships 
That's what Job does. And that's why he's mentioned in this. While we wait for the return of Christ, we are called to worship. You say, well, I know that. But then why do we only do it on Sundays for an hour? We're called to continue our worship through the week. Job chapter 1, 20 to 21 says this. Job 1, 20 to 21. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head. I can relate to this. And fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In the next, uh, Job 13, 15, he says this as he commits himself against the Lord in the midst of time when everyone's turning away from him. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Job 19, 25, for I know my Redeemer lives. At the last, he will stand upon the earth. Somebody say the second coming of Christ. Somebody say that you're going to persevere and maintain and continue. So here's what I want you to hear as I close up today. I'm not going to get to my final point, and that's fine. But when you've been wronged, when you've been wronged, wait on the Lord's return and do the right thing. Do the right thing. You say, well, Pastor Earl, are you suggesting that it's just a power of positive thinking? Is that all you're thinking? Not at all. Because, listen, to interpret the book of James correctly, you need to understand that you have to, be, you have, to have salvation first. That as we're saying, the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. And through that process of of regeneration and renewal and sanctification and changes, God shows us how we're to act. And I think the book of James is exactly that. It tells us Christians within our, our fellowship, within our community, this is how we're to act as we are to wait upon the Lord. So let us do that. Let's wait patiently. And let's be as the scriptures calls. I will finish this message next week because I still probably have 20 minutes. I don't want to just keep on going because you need to go home and tend your gardens or whatever you do on Sundays. I don't want you to do on Sundays. So. But listen, I, I just want to know how excited I am. that, And you should be excited to know that God has not forgotten you. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Arley, I have not been living the light of the second coming. I have not committed my life to Christ. I have not done what God has called me to do. And I just want to take this time in a moment of silence and, and get my heart right with the Lord so I can be prepared for what you have next week for me as we continue this, this, this verse, this chapter. Would you just bow your heads for a moment, please? If you're here this morning, say, Pastor Arley, I am discouraged. I have forgot about the, the message of the gospel. I forgot about the, the, the prophets. I forgot about worship. I forgot about working. I've been so, so consumed with my life's problems that I have lost focus of Christ. I've lost focus of how I am to live in the light of his return. If that is you this morning, I don't stand here to condemn you. I stand here to encourage and to pray with you. Would you just simply raise your hand and say, Pastor Arley, I need encouragement. I needed that reminder. I see your hands. Anybody else? Anybody else? Just raise your hand. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to love you. Christ sees your hand. I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand in the back. Thank you. If you're here this morning, I said it clearly. The book of James is, is written to those who are Christians. And if you have never taken the time to understand the gospel message, that Christ died for our sins, that God loves you regardless of what you've done, where you've been, what you look like. Listen to me. What matters is this, is that today is a new day. Today is the day of your salvation. You can choose today, if God is speaking to your heart, that you accept Christ your Savior. You believe that he rose from the dead. You want to repent of your sin. Acknowledge that you are a, a sinner and say, Arlie, I want... I want Christ in my life. I want to be saved. I want to be different. I want to be changed. Would you just raise your hand this morning? Anyone at all would raise your hand this morning for the first time. I don't care what you look like, what you smell like. I don't care what you've done. God doesn't care. He wants you to come to him so you can be a child of his 
Is that you this morning? Anyone at all? I'll wait. Wait patiently. Now is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this day. I pray for the church words of encouragement that those who are struggling, they're so consumed of the problems of this life that while they're waiting, you remind them that the call to worship, the call to work as a farmer works, and a call to simply uh, rely, rely on you. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would move in each heart here today and be a reminder daily to us that we are not living this Christian life by ourselves, but we are living in the light of the second coming of Christ. We stand firm on the truth that this earth is not the final stage. Christ's coming is the final event. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.